It is Wednesday, June 3rd. It's amazing that we're already into the sixth month of the year and already so many crazy things have happened in our world. And we need to continue to be praying for all those who have had to deal with uh, COVID-19, illness, death, just and the anger that's going on in our country right now in terms of the death of George Floyd and the racism that is being responded to in our country. And we need to take a very measured, loving approach with the heart of Jesus as we think about how we can uh, respond to these situations that are going on all around us. As we continue today in our study of the book of Romans, uh, Paul wants us to re remember uh, many of the things that he's already been discussing. This is lesson number five, and it is based on the sermon that we had this past Sunday. If you have not listened to that sermon yet, I encourage you to go back on our website and on the homepage, you can click on the watch uh, archive sermons link, and it'll take you to the stream spot, and you can choose Sunday sermon, and you can listen to that again. But he's been moving on. He's been since chapter three, verse 21, wanting to help us understand the, the connection between righteousness and justification. Uh, if you have your outlines that I sent out to you, uh, you'll see that this whole section works together and we'll be concluding that section today uh, with chapter five. It is important for us to see the connections between the righteousness that are revealed in the gospel of God and made it available to each of us and the justification that he had to provide for us so that we could stand before him in a right relationship with him. And so let me go to share my screen and we'll get started in our lesson together. Our theme verse for our entire study comes from chapter 12, verse 1. This is where Paul is going. This is what he wants us to see. It's so important that I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Living sacrifices. So I encourage you in view of God's mercy. And that's what this whole first five chapters has been about. The mercy, the grace, the love of God and how he has fulfilled this in his son, Jesus. And so now as we come to chapter five, there's a couple of verses we want to remember. Uh, first, we want to remember the situation we're in in the syndemic that has been raging since the very beginning. And that is going to become a central point of Paul's argument again in chapter 5. And that there is none of us who can stand before God as judge and not be declared guilty. Because we've all sinned. But he's reminded us at the beginning of this whole section that apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, of which the laws and prophets testify. And this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And as he revealed the uh, atoning sacrifice, the justification that has been made by God, given to us by grace, and yet that cost him so much, and paying for being our, our redeemer, it is important then that we understand the fullness of what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and to understand this righteousness of God that has been testified to about the law and the prophets, which is the point of chapter four in his discussion of Abraham, who came before circumcision, whose righteousness came 400 years before the law, credited to him. They weren't written for him alone, but for us also to whom God will credit righteousness. 
for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He has delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. And so now as we come to chapter five, he says, let's look at the beauty, the results, the fruit of this justification that God has given us and what it just some very practical things that it means for us in everyday life. And they're all introduced in the first couple of verses of chapter five. And they are peace, joy, and hope. Let's read again through those first few verses very quickly. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And this is sort of an introductory thought here at the end of verse 5. That's going to jump us into chapters six through eight. And the love that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what that is going to mean to us on a practical level. Uh, but here he's already mentioned the, the peace that we can find in God. Not a peace that's a, just an absence of war. It is a peace that is a part of a loving relationship. In fact, he says, and you are brought into the presence of God himself. What an amazing thought. Being brought into the presence of God himself. In the ancient world, you might end up going before a king uh, who would pronounce judgment on you, and he might pronounce you not guilty of whatever charges were against you. But then you went on your way. You did not remain in his presence. You had to have a special place. You had to have a relationship with that king to remain in the presence of the king. But God, as part of his redemption and atonement and giving of righteousness and justification, gives us a peace that's part of a personal relationship with him and entering into his presence. Now, that's, that's an important point to remember when we get to check, uh, verses 11 and following. Uh, the peace, and closely connected to it, and always is throughout Paul's writing, is joy. Uh, as I mentioned Sunday, I believe I mentioned this in both services, uh, that there's an old Scott church saying that peace is joy at rest, and joy is peace dancing. And it's, it's such a beautiful and picture. Now think about uh, peace. We're in, still have the joy, but we're at rest. But when we express the joy, it is the peace of being in the presence of God that is dancing, that is singing, that is expressing itself, loving. It. And it all comes about and brings about a hope that can only be found in the presence of God. Because he says, I, I know that this peace and this joy uh, can are even found and expressed in our sufferings, which is not something we're going to be we normally think about, uh, especially as Christians in America. Uh, Christians throughout the world and throughout history have also uh, faced great suffering for their faith, and he says, this is something that overcomes anything that we could ever go through. And that becomes an overriding uh, theme throughout the rest of the book. That what God has given us trumps everything else. It overwhelms everything else. It is greater than everything else. And Paul understood persecution because not only had he given it before he became a Christian, but after he became a Christian, not long after, uh, there was a plot to assassinate him, and they had to lower him over the wall from Damascus. Uh, he had been 
beaten many times. He had been stoned and left for dead. He had been left homeless and sleeping out in the wilderness. He understood suffering for the name of Jesus, and he thought it was all just pure joy. Because, as he says, that suffering leads to perseverance, perseverance to character, and character, hope. Because we know it's something we can hang on to and believe in. Because, why? For you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's easy to focus, as I mentioned Sunday, on uh, just the right time being the physical time uh, going on in the world. And yes, God fully aware that the Roman government had established a peace where people could travel peacefully. They had established a road system. They had established shipping lanes. They had established so many things through which the gospel was then going to spread. But that is not Paul's focus. The focus is it was the right time because we were powerless. We were the ungodly. We were sinners. And yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so he says, as we have been justified by God's grace, how much more? And we enjoy this life that we have, this justification that comes from God. He says, let me make one more point to remind everybody that this is about Jesus. It all comes from God through Jesus, just like he'd begun the whole thing. Let me find my sheet over here. He says, this is a demonstration of God's love. And he says, let me go ahead and illustrate that more fully for you. And not just go back to Abraham, who was the beginning of the Israelite nation and the covenant relationship with them. He says, let's go all the way back to the beginning and talk about that first human, that first man who came into the world and has was one of those who brought sin and death into the world because of their selfish actions. He starts in verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who was the pattern of the one to come. And he goes on because he knows they're going to be asking the question, well, what about law? Verse 20, the law was added so that the trespass may increase. And that same message he gave back in chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, the law makes us conscious of the sin, or should make us conscious of the sin. And so he says, now, you know, Adam, who was the first human created, the first man, uh, and he's not trying to get into an argument here who sinned first, whether it was Adam or Eve. Uh, we know from Genesis 3, it was Eve who took the first bite from the fruit. But Adam was right there. And the point is, he was the first human created. Eve was created out of him. And through their sin, and the sin that was going to continue on uh, through the generations to come, even up until today, sin has reigned. And we look through, go back, read through uh, Genesis 3 through 5. We, you really see the effect and what I call the snowball effect of sin in the world. There are those immediate effects uh, that affected Adam and Eve and everybody who came after, whether it was the uh, increased birth pains in giving birth to children for women, whether it was 
now there's going to be thorns and thistles and other things that you're going to have to try to get rid of and farming and producing food was going to become much more difficult. You know, all of these things were going to have affected us since that very time. But more importantly, he says, sin has reigned. And even after you know, we move from the eating of a piece of fruit to a brother killing his brother to within a few chapters, the thought of every person was evil all the time. And God is grieved because he has made mankind. And so he brings the flood, though he saves one man and his family because that one man was humble and he walked with God and God considered him righteous. But even after that, sin continues, whether it's at the Tower of Babel or any other story within the Bible you want to pull up. Sin is there. Sin is uh, controlling our world and the destiny of humans. Over against that, he says, but there are several gifts God has given us. First and foremost is that of Jesus, who is the antithesis to Adam. To Adam, sin has come into the world. To Jesus now, who is the first of this new generation, righteousness from God has come into the world and has made available to anyone and everyone who will put their faith in him. And we now enter into the reign of grace. After talking about these gifts in, in Romans 5, beginning in verse 15, uh, verse 16, again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one many are made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. In other words, it overwhelmed the sin. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord, which is what God is seeking. Where he is bringing about this new reign of grace that allows us to enter into his presence, as he talked back in the beginning of the chapter. And Enjoy those wonderful gifts of peace, joy, and uh, hope that can only be found through his son, Jesus. And so this is uh, Paul's way of saying, look, what, the way things started were beautiful, and then we messed it up. You, know, you go back, you look at Genesis 1 and 2, and creation has come into being. Mankind, humankind, is living in harmony with God in harmony with creation, and in harmony with each other. And after sin comes into the world, all three of those relationships are broken. Now in Jesus Christ, we can once again live in harmony with God and in harmony with each other through Jesus Christ. And according to the end of the book of Revelation, when we go to the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth, we will once again live in harmony with everything in all of God's creation. But all of this can only be found in Jesus Christ. And again, if you go back uh, to our outline, what he is trying to show us through this whole thing is where this righteousness and justification comes from. He begins by talking about it is through Jesus, and the need for faith, Abraham being our example, and the great uh, peace, joy, and hope that that brings into our lives because we are now back in a right relationship with God. We are at peace with him. And again, this has happened through Jesus. 
not a single human until him has lived the life that he did and made this available to us. And so it's such a, a beautiful thing that God has accomplished for us. And if you look on your outline, you see that we're coming up on chapter six through eight, which are talking about righteousness given and sanctification or life in the Holy Spirit. What is that going to mean to us? And uh, how do we start to begin to apply this to everyday life? And he's going to sort of set up in chapter six through eight uh, his argument and then really bring it into play on a very practical level uh, in chapters 12 through 15. Uh, so that's where we're going to be going in the next several weeks and hope that you will follow along with us. But such a powerful message because of what God has done through Jesus, we can now stand before him and be pronounced not guilty and be at peace with him and come into his presence, which brings real joy and real hope into this world because of what he has done for us and because of the faith that we have put in his son, Jesus. It was great to be together again with several of you this past Sunday. Uh, we had our nine o'clock down in the fellowship hall. We had 1030 in the auditorium. Uh, we kept everybody uh, separated so that there was no cross contamination and just appreciate so much those who did come uh, following the guidelines that we have put before them, which are based on uh, passages in Romans 13, uh, that it, love does no harm to its neighbor because love is the fulfillment of the law. And so we are con going to continue to ask our folks who come to the building uh, to wear a mask, to practice social distancing, to wash your hands, uh, to do all the things that we've asked you to do, because this is not about our own personal uh, rights. This is about denying self, taking up our cross and following Jesus and doing what's best for others. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, one thing I want to go ahead and ask you to do is if you have not already said, yes, I would like to come to the building and are ready to start coming to the building either at 9 or 1030, please let me or Gwen know so that we can prepare in advance and make sure uh, that we have everything that we need in place. Uh, we look forward to being with those who can come to the building Sunday. And I want to personally thank every single one of you who has chosen for the good of not only your health, but the health of others to stay home and worship with us online. Uh, that is, I know, is a great sacrifice for you, uh, but you are doing the right thing for you and for others. And we appreciate that so very much. And so uh, we do want to uh, ask that each of you continue praying uh, for our congregation, for everybody in it, uh, for the work that's going on. We had a good window visit today at Autumn Care. We also were able to go over to Azalea and have a window visit with Bob Barnett. And there's just so many people out there who are in need of love and concern and hope that you will continue to pray for them and do whatever you can uh, during this time. God bless you all. And I look forward to a spending time in worship of God together again this Sunday.